Lucia? Yeah. Shall I say Lucia or Lucia? I feel like Lucia. Okay, then, then you say But that's yeah. more accurate? No, I think of both. You know? Depends on where you have my mom or my, or my dad. Then it's crucial. Well, you know, I, I don't want to get there. Okay, we, we would like to proceed. Please sit down. Do you have your gong? <laughs> okay, it's a great pleasure to introduce Lucia, Lucia Meloni from the Max Planck Institute. Hmm? It is on. Lucia Meloni from the Max Planck Institute for Empirical Aesthetics. She'll be talking about the role of predictions in consciousness. It will be wonderful to hear after all our arguments <laughs> all the time. Lucia, please. <laughs> thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Leon and Daphna and the people at the IIS for having us here. You are coming after a couple of months that we have been here dwelling on consciousness and trying to understand what we are talking about. And I think that the first talk was a good reminder of the problems that we are facing. Um, and in, in the spirit of the deconstructing and reconstructing consciousness, what I'm going to do today is to try to build a story to then tear it apart. Um, so the story goes that many years ago, um, I, you know, and I guess that we, we have all stumbled across these kind of images, you know, where we look at an image, we say, well, that's a black and white, you know, thing. I don't know it. Um, then I show you this image. I go back and voila, your perception change. And it will change forever, which is this weird thing. <laughs> so there is this, this one-shot perceptual learning where something that supposedly didn't have an impact on consciousness did have, which is our memories and our experience. And I thought, wait a minute. So, so you know, I was in this mode of destyling the correlates and thinking of all of the processes that have nothing to do with consciousness. And here was one where it was just right obvious that it did seem to have a pro uh, an, an impact. Um, and this just can happen in a minute, as I show you now, but it can also happen across our lifetime. So if, for those of you who grew up around these clocks, <laughs> um, you, know, you may actually perceive the tilt as different from the one here. And the tilt is in essence the same. The only difference is that you know, like if we look at those all the time, all the time, all the time, we integrate those, they become our priors, and we then discard the tilt. Right? And that's why then we have this you know, strong adaptation. So then again, this, there is this, again, memories, experience, learning, where either our, our experience changed forever and it has been changing across our lifetime, or it has changed in a minute, right? And I thought, how can we actually understand consciousness from this perspective where memory seems to play a, a critical role? And of course, there is always somebody who has said something about this. And, and one person that has been thinking about a, a lot about the role of uh, priors and the memories and learning is called Friston in the context of predictive coding. And, you know, like say 10 years ago when I was thinking about this thing, predictive coding wasn't a thing. Now it's a thing. Um, and, and the thing goes like this. <laughs> it goes that, you know, the idea that, the idea that Carl has is that we, perception, first of all, is constructive. So we don't have, and, and for that matter, consciousness is also constructive. There is nothing like a reality out there and that we're really just mirroring it. We're just, we're, through our experience and through our memories, we are getting a construction of what it is out there. And how do we build that? By actually having feedback. So in this case, imagine that you actually ha are perceiving something. The, the activity goes to, say, like um, early visual areas. It goes into layer four. It goes up. But then it will actually be changed by feedback from higher cortical areas. And that feedback will be either our experiences before or our memories. So this is a, an interesting framework whereby learning, memory, and you know, perception are all entangled into one. Um, and this will actually, and, and the, uh, what is interesting about this framework is that the, um, these priors are hierarchical. So they can actually come from something you know, like very unspecific, like say a word, right? And then you know, like say in a, in a specific tone, like it's say like, I'm saying like house, it's my voice, it's my, uh, it's my pitch, and et cetera. You can actually predict to the, to the, to the level of you know, what would be my, my sound. 
Um, so it seemed kind of like obvious that you know this framework would be interesting and relevant for consciousness. And we started by saying like, okay, let's assume that actually it does. But what is the problems that we face when we um, when we embrace this uh, framework? And the first one was something kind of like simple, but it, but this is the, how it started in the first experiment that not all predictions are equal in regard to perception. They actually work in different ways. In the first ex in the first image that I show you, they stabilize perception. It kind of like it makes sense, right? So the world keeps changing. There's all sort of you know like very low level differences, and nonetheless, I keep seeing Rafi even though the light is constantly <coughs> changing. So Priors will stabilize our perception. That's kind of like clear. But they also do this other weird thing that I showed you before. They, they, you know, they generate adaptation. So they actually shift you away from what you actually thought. Um, so the question is, well, you know, so if not, if not all predictions are equal and they, they, they influence perception in different ways, how are they implemented? Um, and the second one is, if we really think of, um, if we embrace this issue of well, we have a history, uh, and you know, and whoever we are is a history that we had before. Then this means that we will have perceptual phenotypes. Like everyone is going to be different, but in actually systematic ways that we can also investigate, right? Um, and the third one that is uh, another aspect that um, uh, Carl has talked a lot about, but we tend kind of like tend to you know forget, is that predictions not only matter for perception, but that action also is it's, it's like perception action cycle. You know, so we can either change our perceptions or we can change the way in which we sample the world to actually you know, like make, be conformed with our predictions. So how are we going to cl close the loop if we really embrace this, um, this framework? So let's start with the first one. So as, as I showed you before, um, if you have never seen this image, I do this, I do that, it's clear. Priors will stabilize perception. In the other case, they, they, I'm going to just give you an example as to how they actually shift us apart. Uh, how can, where is my mouse here sorry um, so I, I will ask you to look at this dot and keep fixating right and this thing is gonna you know like move 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 and then eventually it's gonna stop and I'm gonna ask you in which direction you actually see the lines right um, so, let me see. so here we go you see it in parallel or not <laughs> okay so that's exactly the point so they actually uh, they are parallel but because you have ha you have been seeing them in the different perspective then you actually tend to see them shifted right again it's constructive it's just based on adaptation right um so in reality when we think about this uh, the how priors affect our perception they will do it in these two ways which we call exploration and exploitation mode and it's actually relevant because if we are always seeing what we expect to see we would also be missing, like if you think of foraging, I keep, you know, like feeding, you know, feeding in the same place. Well, at some point, <laughs> you know, like the food is going to run, I'm going to run away of food. I'd rather be also just looking at the other alternatives, right? And you can think also, you know, like, you know, if, you, if we think of curiosity, it's another way in which we can, you know, like think of a mechanism for curiosity. We always need to explore the others. But how do we go away from the, how do we explore the others by knowing what we know, right? So it's also, uh, it, it serves a dual purpose. Um, so how do we investigate this? Um, we go to this very, like this is going to be actually uh, an opposite talk, you know, from Leah talk, you know? So this, you know, we like dots, <laughs> you know? <laughs> we like completely, um, you know, artificial stimuli, but they are artificial in interesting ways. So I show you this, they are multi-stable images. So you can either see them as <laughs> lines that goes in this direction, in this direction, or in a third direction, I don't remember which one. Um, I, and, I, and I ask the subjects, in which direction do you see those dots? And, and we can vary perception of the subjects by changing the so-called like aspect ratio, right? So if, if I show you this one, you tend to perceive this direction and this direction the same way. If I change that, the ratio here, you tend to align the dots al along this direction and the way around in this direction, right? So then by changing the amount of information, and this will become relevant later on for the case of adaptation, because remember that you tend to shift away the more information you have. So if I do like, if I do, you know, as I, as I showed you before, like if I move the lines very, very much in one direction, you will tend to see them in the other direction, right? Um, so this is, this is how we're going to try to manipulate adaptation. Uh, and secondly, we present this uh, lattice that is actually, comp it's tri-stable. So you can see it in three different di directions. We always show the same, right? 
And this is the impossible task for the subjects, right? And this is how you know, like we kind of like look at the effect of the priors, because we only manipulate this one. But the effect on perception, we keep it, we keep it the same, right? Um, so in, the in, the, in this part, what you will have is the so-called like hysteresis, which will be you know, subjects choose here one orientation, and we then sort the trials by how often did they choose the same orientation versus how often they chose a different orientation, right? And you can also look at uh, adaptation by what, how much the orientation that they choose here is determined by the amount of information that we give them before, right? Um, all right. So uh, in this plot, so what you can see here is um, this is how much information we gave. So in this case, we, um, the, and this is the, resp the, the behavior response for the first stimulus. So in this case, we uh, bias the subjects to perceive in the zero orientation, and they are actually lawful. So they perceive it at zero, much more probable. Here we, we um, bias them to perceive them at 90, and they are also lawful. So we know that you know, they are doing the task properly. right? What is relevant is what, what are they going to choose in the second one that is just the same. So we, we, have nev we, are, we have been presenting for the whole experiment the same stimulus. right? And what happened is that they chose now, uh, the, more, the more they saw one orientation here, the less they're going to see the orientation there. Right? And that's the effect of adaptation, right? as I showed you before. So this one goes this, way, this direction, the other one goes this direction. So if they chose uh, 90 very little, they're going to choose 90 a lot on the other way around. Right? And now you can also sort the trials by not just, um, um, uh, we're <laughs> actually not sorting them, by the way. We're just you know, looking at what the responses are. Right? The, w the way in which you can look at hysteresis is how likely they are to choose the same orientation. So in this case, this line represents how often they chose the, the zero, having chosen zero before, and how often they chose zero, having chosen 90 before. Right? And the fact that it's parallel is really cool for us, because it means that these two effects are independent, right? behaviorally, at least. Um, so now the question is, so now we have a grip on a paradigm where we have these two priors. Again, it's absolutely you know, artificial, but you know, we have a very good grip on you know, what we are looking at. And we run the same experiment now with the subjects in the scanner. And we look for what are the areas that we have this distinction. So now, again, we are sorting the trials. We're, we're showing the, the same images to the subjects, but we're sorting them to what they saw before. right? And the, the areas that you see here are areas that actually make this distinction, the difference between having seen the same versus sw switching between one and the other. What is conspicuous is, first of all, that we don't see early visual cortex activated here, but more like a, a, you know, a, a IT or fusiform gyrus, IPS, and the dorsomid prefrontal cortex. What else did we see? That also whenever subjects saw the non-predicted orientation, they actually have higher activity than when they saw the same orientation twice, right? And this goes, it's, you know, it's not evidence for anything, it's just an observation, right? Um, now, what, uh, an, an interesting finding that we had that we were not expecting was this area, the dorsal middle prefrontal cortex. It was the only area that correlated with the behavior of the subject. So the changes in that area correlated with how strongly the subject would have the hysteresis effect. And this just, you know, it was an observation, but we chase it. Because we thought, okay, that's interesting, you know. So now we, but this was fMRI. We didn't really have a good grip on what was going on. So we thought, okay, let's just go to intracranial recordings. So in this case, we had six patients doing the same experiment as our, you know, poor healthy <laughs> volunteers, um, and they had electrodes either in the dorsal prefrontal cortex or in the lateral prefrontal cortex, right? Um, and again, they they did the same experiment as before. And what we have again here is we take the trials where they chose the zero orientation both times. So the, the choosing is the same. But the, all that is the difference is what they had actually chosen the, the, in, the time, in the time before. And what you see here, this is the effect sizes. So around 300 milliseconds, there is an increase in the activity in the, in the middle prefrontal cortex for when the subjects actually change their perception. We didn't observe that. Now when we look, go to into the lateral cortex, th that difference actually is not there at all, right? Now, um, the, sorry, what I, what I was showing you here is the activity in the so-called like, high gamma. This is something that we typically tend to investigate in, in um, intracranial recordings. The question was, is it specific to that frequency band? Because there are some theories that actually think that you know, like, it could be other frequency bands. 
What we observed, and again, here is the effect size. This is the high gamma. This is really, really big. None of the other frequency bands actually contributed as much. The only one that actually does it a little bit later on is theta. But we, also, we saw nothing, 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 nothing in um, beta, nor in low gamma, nor in alpha. So it's only specific in this case to high frequencies and theta, but later on. Um, again, one criticism that we had at the time with when, we, when we had that paradigm was, how much is this related to perception versus choosing twice the same thing? Right? And we had actually taken care of one thing I didn't mention, but um, the subjects had to choose the responses. We presented them for different options. And the, the um, option that they chose was randomized for the second one. So at least you know, what they click on the screen was not the same. But you could say, well, but you know, at some level, they had chosen twice the same thing. Right? Um, so what we did here was to show them, in the first case, a cloud of dots. So there was no orientation. There. And, and we asked them, like, just choose something. You know? no, and if it is, this is a choice, they, we can now sort the trials again based on you know, choosing twice. Right? Um, first of all, we did not observe behaviorally any hysteresis effect. So there was nothing that, because I chose something before, I will choose it again. No, in this case, we didn't <coughs> observe that. But also, the dorsal mute prefrontal cortex didn't, make a didn't have this increase in high gamma that we observed before. So we believe that this is just not decisional, per se. There's something to do with perception, how much those priors affect the way in which we perceive. Right? Um, then, uh, furthermore, we had these rare opportunities to actually encounter a patient who actually had had a resection of that area because she had epilepsy. So <laughs> it wasn't a stroke. You know, it was a neurosurgeon who came with a, you know, and made a, little, a, a very nice cut on that area, right? And we just happened to you know, like have her in the unit. So we thought, okay, if this is true, and this area is so important, maybe you know, like we wouldn't observe hysteresis in this patient, which in essence is actually what we observed. Um, so this is the, the, the patient. This is how often she chose um, the same orientation versus a different orientation based on the previous option. You, you can see there's nothing. In, in the, in the non-lesional cases, we actually have a big effect. You could say, well, you know, it was an epilepsy patient. You know, did, what about the rest? This is all of the sick cases that actually we had. She is here. So her effect size is really minimal, <laughs> you know, um, to, to non-existence. So it seems, OK, it's one case, granted. But it's one case, you know, of somebody that, you know, it's not a, it's, it's not a you know, stroke. Right? Um, OK, so then, at least from this data, we seem to, or we can conclude that this area seemed to actually really play a role in stabilizing our perception. Now, what about, uh, er, what about, what is the mechanism, or what are the areas related to changing our perception? And in this case, we took the, we, we were inspired by how adaptation works. And we know that the more, the more information we give into one orientation, the more we kind of like fatigue those neurons, right? So we took that logic. And the idea was, in this case, imagine that I, that I have um, a, a bias table one. So I give information for both orientations. Then you would expect that the population of neurons that do 0 and 90, um, they activate to the same degree. And then they, therefore, when I show the next stimulus, they also go down to the same degree, right? But if I actually take a stimulus where I don't have the same information, in this case, what you would have is for the first orientation, you would have a difference, so in between 90 and, and, and 0. But then when we, when we present the very same one, then we're going to have reductions in the activity, right? Um, and the other one would not, re would not reduce as much. Now, in our experiment, the reason why you see it you know, like higher is because we're only choosing the orientation that for which we gave the least information. So that's why you, you see like the most repelling effect. Um, and what we observe is that the only area in the whole brain, when we looked at you know, like everywhere, uh, that chose this pattern was a, a very narrow area between B2 and B3. Right? And then we did, sorry. Um, when, then when we took, again, much like in the behavioral effect, when we took the activity in these areas and we looked for hysteresis or their way around, We've, we did not find the other effect. So they actually really seem to be separate uh, networks. Um, now, the when can actually postdoc, you know, make a, you know, a model? <laughs> I'm not saying that this is pre-op, but postdoc. A model as to how the effects actually that we observe are, are happening. 
And, and here again, the Bayesian framework is interesting because we can actually have a distinction between the sensory evidence and the priors. And we think that if we actually use these two different terms, we can accommodate the, the adaptation phenomenon and the hysteresis phenomenon. How we can do that? We think that the hysteresis alters the prior versus the uh, adaptation, in this case the, the repulsion effect, actually alters the likelihood. And since they actually map into independent terms, you can actually have mixes of both of them. Right? It's just a model, you know, we haven't, you know. It's an alternative model to, one, to the ones that are in the literature that actually postulate that both of those phenomena are done by the same parameter. And we thought it was not, I mean, at least based on the, behavior, the brain data, doesn't seem to be the case that they are actually the same. All right. Um, so, so far, so good. So it seems that there is at least that the higher level priors map into higher, higher cortical areas. The adaptation maps into lower cortical areas, fine. But now, can we understand oops, different? Um, can we understand different phenotypes of people based on the same framework? Why can we not? Hmm. Oh, there you go. Um, based on the same framework, and we thought, okay, there is at least in the literature, we can think of people who are actually different already just to start with, or that we think that they are different. On the one end, we have people that suffer from schizophrenia. And what has been described in the literature is that they actually tend to, tend to be much less prone to perceptual illusions, right? On the other spectrum, you have people that have synesthesia. I know if you know, if you, if you don't know about it, this, this is people who, they are not, they are neurotypical people, but they tend to see, for instance, letters in a particular color. And they, and that's systematic. Everyone sees it in a different color, but every time you show a synesthet who sees an A in red, it will sit always in the same red, right? Uh, but then it, another thing said it will be yellow, but it will always be yellow. So in that sense, there is intra-subject consistency, not inter-subject consistency. Um, and we thought, okay, can we try to understand from this very same framework um, people to who actually have these two different, you know, uh, uh, spectrum of perception? And we took a paradigm that we had done, you know, many years ago, where we present noise, and then we showed in in, in between the noise we present letters. And we unravel them, you know, like little by little. So, and as you see here, in the, in the in the strongest case, you can see a very a very clear letter A. And then what we do is we put it back. So in this case, we go from a lot of noise to seeing clearly an A, and then from seeing clearly an A to seeing noise again. What happens in perception is the so-called hysteresis phenomenon, which is that the threshold will change just because you have a prior. So you continue seeing that A for longer times, right? And the question that we had was. What will happen? So what will be the, pom the moment at which synesthetes and schizophrenics and normal population will see these letters? Right? The prediction was if, uh, if uh, synesthetes have a prior, they will start seeing that letter earlier because they have an extra Q color to actually perceive the letter. If the schizophrenics actually are less resilient on this prior, are less um, prone to perceive these priors, then they will be much more relying on the sensory evidence. Therefore, they will see it later. Right? Um, okay, and then the letters that we chose was, uh, so for each synesthet, we asked them, you know, to pick their colors, and then we would just map uh, the, le the this, um, uh, this place into their different colors. We also can turn a synesthet into a non-synesthet by showing them symbols, right? So then you actually have inter-subject control, right? So you show them, you know, like, again, the same color, but a symbol, and they shouldn't have anything. Like, they should behave like normals, right? Um, so what did we observe? This is, the, this is the curve when we actually showed the so-called like, synesthesia-inducing stimuli. And as you can see here, these are the normals in red. These are the schizophrenics. So they actually tend to perceive them. They take much longer to perceive them. And these are the synesthetes. They take much less information to perceive them. Right? But now, you know, if the experiment goes well, it should be, it should be like this. Right? Because the synesthetes should be like us when they are seeing symbols. Right? And in fact, they are. Nonetheless, the schizophrenics actually are still being less, re less reliant on these priors. Right? Um, now, as I told you, the one interesting thing that this experiment uh, that this experiment allows us is to see, like, by how much once they have seen the stimulus, they can rely on those explicit priors. Like, I know that now I'm seeing an A, right? And the you know now Leah explained you how to how to read this plot. So, <laughs> so this is the uh, the decreasing flank the, or the when you go down in the uh, in the inf in, in the information when you go up. And if you're in the identity line, then this means that your perception is actually the same when you go up and down. 
if you are in this direction, and this means that your perception, you're continue seeing it for longer, for longer time. This means that you need less information to continue seeing it. So in this case, you see the stimuli, you see like in level two, here you see that level one, right? So, and it's the same stimulus. And what you can see in this case is that for the synesthetes, the controls in the schizophrenics, everything is in the line below. So they seem to all be equally relying on those explicit priors, right? Um, which is good news and bad news because we thought, okay, if schizophrenics are relying, could it be that because we give them explicit priors, now they can overcome, you know, well, no. <laughs> they are just, you know, giving them or not giving them these priors, okay, make them to profit from them, but the same degree as everyone else. And if they started from a lower baseline, they just can't overcome that, you know, which is what you see here. So they, all of them profit from those explicit priors, but it's not that schizophrenic profit more or, or synesthetic profit more. All right. Um, okay, this is just the same, just to show you. Uh, okay, so it seems that at least based on this framework, we can characterize people. Doesn't tell us much, but you know, at least uh, we, you know, at least we, we have a grip on, you know, we can use the, the computation in this case, you know, to characterize people. Right. Um, the next aspect of the predictive coding is that our perception should change, but also our actions should be informative as to what we perceived. Right. That's the, that's the other end of the spectrum, and somehow we know that this is the case because if, for instance, I show you this image. And I ask you to look, for instance, for the gender, or for like you know how rich or how poor people are, or you know like how many kids, blah blah. Your your patterns of eye movements will change depending on what the task was. So we know that our motor control reflects what we are looking for, right? So the the good because I just have five minutes. <laughs> um, so what we what what we thought is okay. Can we now use the eye movements to unravel or kind of like have a grip on the priors that these subjects may have, right? And uh, Ra Raul, what he did is that to, he took you know, images. In this case, you can take the contours. And by making the dots closer or further apart, you can actually mimic those contours. So now you actually have a good grip on what you're seeing based on you know, like the proximity of these dots. And we did the same experiment as before. So we went from you know, this completely you know, uh, homogeneous uh, pattern to something where you could see, and then we went the way around. right? Um, but in this case, we ask, what is the patterns of my movement that the subjects are going to have? And how is that going to be informative for the priors that they have? And what you can observe is, if they, if they know nothing about what they have to see, and you give them this impossible thing where there is nothing, they just keep looking. You know, these, these are all the fixations that they have. As, the as you give the information, the patterns of fixations reduce and concentrate on what they, it should be. What is relevant and what is more interesting for us is what's going to happen once they know they revisit the very same image. Well, now what happens is that people, first of all, like they fixate much less, which is oops, sorry, which is what you can see here. So the, the, the fixation spread is actually much smaller. And why? Because when we actually look at the images, what they do is that now they go into the points that are actually maximally informative. So you go and test your priors. You, know, you don't need to go and sample everything randomly. You just go and pick that information that allows you to see what is the image that you, are, that you had in your mind. I say, like, OK, I'm seeing a canon. Right? So that's why people don't need to you know, like just look around. All right. Then finally, the next thing that we started wondering was we do not only have a perception of you know, the, the things out there, but we also have this inner sense of our body, right? And this is, this is what we use to interact with objects. How much that this inner sense of our body will affect the way in which we perceive the object? And there is a very long you know, uh, line of research um, started by Patrick Haggard where they looked at how do we perceive the size of our hand? And you would say, well, it's radical, right? I mean, like I live with my hand, I touch my object. But if I ask you to actually to close your eyes and point where you think your knuckles are and where you think your hand is, you're going to distort it in a very systematic way. You're going to think that, you have, that your fingers are shorter, you know, <laughs> and, that you're, and, the, and that this palm is actually wider. So we have a very, very ugly hand you know, in our head, right? It's so like shorter, you know, like think of, you know, like, um, and this happens for both of your hands, you know, like left and right. So it doesn't even matter where, you know, you, you know, right more, no. 
both of your hands are going to be distorted. And the question was, so if this is the case, what happens with the objects? So if we are always, you know, again, in, the, in this question, like, do we perceive them veridically? Because if we perceive them veridically, how do we interact with them? Um, so what Valeria did in this case, she uh, ran a task, which I'm going to explain in a minute, and she asked, like, OK, let's, let's ask the subjects to estimate the size of their hand, again, the, the length of their fingers and the width of their palm, and also objects that they interact a lot. You know, like in this case, we thought at the very beginning, let's just ask for a control stimulus that we have as much familiarity as our hand, our mobile phone. Um, surprise, surprise, I'm going to show you later on, so it didn't turn out to be a control <laughs> stimulus. Um, then we thought, okay, now let's ask the subjects to uh, estimate the size of their own mobile phone versus some other's mobile phone. And you would say, well, you know, like I know a lot of my mobile phone, I don't know yours. I may have different, you know, unless I have this, this, this inactive view, right? Uh, but also, what happens when I show you a fake hand that looks literally like you, no, it looks like yours, but of course it's not yours, right? Um, what happened with other objects? Again, like a fake hand and a mug that we use a lot, right? And what happened with stuff like a cactus that, of course, we would never touch, right? Or things that are disgusting. You know, she, she went you know, through the travel to actually put you know, like hairs and make it very disgusting like a soap, right? And then also mouse that we actually use all the time. So these two are literally very similar in shape, but you wouldn't want to touch this one. And you, but this one, you're OK, right? Um, and, and she had a task whereby the subjects had to, first of all, like look at these objects for like three minutes before, only for those that they didn't have uh, exposure. And the, the assumption was that, OK, I don't want to overemphasize exposure to your own mobile phone. Um, and then she presented on the computer screen lines that were either horizontal or vertical. And she asked, and she varies the length of the lines, and asking the subjects, think of the, the length of your hand and tell me where this line is actually smaller or bigger. Right? <coughs> and that's how she estimated the, si the perceived size of the, uh, of the objects. So the first thing that, that we found out is much like what has been uh, described before. <coughs> first of all, like in our experiment, which we still don't understand why, we tend to perceive everything as smaller. All of the objects, not just the, not just the hand, all of the objects. But what is relevant is how, the ho how we will distort the horizontal dimension and the vertical dimension. right? Uh, and we replicated what Patrick Haggard has uh, found before, that you know, we distort more the vertical dimension than the horizontal dimension. right? What was interesting that she found was that we do the same thing for the mobile phone. It doesn't matter where it's mine or it's yours. I will just distort it the very same way. Right? What happened if you, you know, with a mouse and with, your, with a mug? The mouse, you could say, like, you know, it's, you know, at least it's sem something similar to the mobile phone, but the mug, we touch it in different ways. Right? So we thought, OK, it's, it's kind of like a control object, the same distortion. Um, but interestingly, you perceive veridically a fake hand. You know, and we have replicated this across three different experiments, so three different populations. So the, a fake hand, it doesn't matter. You will perceive it. You know, like the horizontal and vertical dimension will be fine. Now, what is interesting is what happens with the cactus. You now actually distort in the other dimension. You know? So the things that you don't interact with, you distort in the, in the other one. Um, so this is now the, the patterns of distortions when we put all of the objects together. So we have, on the one hand, what we think are objects that we interact with all the time, and we tend to distort them similarly. So the, our own hand, a mouse and a mag. The mobile phone is, is closer to our hand than objects that we will not interact with. Right? Now she thought, what? There's just something weird with this you know, like fake hand. You know, <laughs> why? So we thought, okay, maybe it's because we don't have the sense of ownership. Like, you know, if you see a fake hand, you wouldn't even want to touch it. You know, it's like, you know, like, it's like an alien thing, right? Um, so we thought, can we, take, can we change the phenomenon if we make this hand to be a part of your own body, right? So you can, you can capitalize on the so-called like, so like rubber hand illusion, right? So you, you put the, the hand there, you touch it synchronously with your own hand, and you kind of like tend to have a perceptual drift. You think that your hand is actually the thing that is on the table when it wasn't. To you know, cut the long story short, it didn't make any difference. So if either if you, if you have, if it is your own hand, you're going to have the distortion, whether you, know, you have the, the rubber hand or not, you know, pre and post, it doesn't change at all. And, you know, and, and if, if I show you the rubber hand, I can do the perceptual illusion and everything, and you're, you're going to nonetheless 
perceive these objects as something different. So, um, yeah, so at least we can tell that it's not the sense of, you know, like I own it. All right, so just to conclude, I hope that I, I build a case that seeing is imagining that there is a face in there, face in there, and face in there. So we just believe more than what we really see, right? Um, again, this case, I guess that, you know, for those of you who don't know, uh, you would say, well, these two gentlemen are actually very different. Actually, they aren't. It's the same person. It's just, you know, your history of, okay, you tend to map this into a different prototype than the other one, but they are, it says, in essence, the same. Right. Um, so does this mean, however, th you know, through all of these, you know, studies, what we, I think that we have good evidence for is that predictive coding is a good theory to understand uh, some aspect of perception, you know. It, you know, it explains, you know, like the different priors that we have, that it could actually help make us, help make us help, you know, different perceptual prototypes that we have, also the, the actions that we make and how that interface, that, um, how we inter interface with objects. But does it make it a theory of consciousness, as some people claim? And I don't think so. I really think that there is no way how predictive coding <coughs> will be a theory of consciousness. It's a theory of many things, but not of consciousness. Um, is it nonetheless useful for us to understand consciousness? And I think it is. You know, and we should continue doing it, you know, like, and that's all fine. But thinking, you know, and I think this is, this is an important, um, because in that sense, you, you know, Predictive coding has been claimed as a, as a unifying theory of the brain. Well, I, I would claim that consciousness is part of my brain. <laughs> so it explains certain things, but not all of them. Um, yeah, and to conclude, I hope that I, you know, build a case that predictions do play a role in perception, and therefore we need to probably investigate more the role of memories into our perception. Um, that you know they but they have this really weird role like sometimes they 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 make us to be, to see the same sometimes change they can explain the perceptual phenotypes and something that you know we should probably do more is what is the perception action cycle and how do those priors in, will interact with uh, you know in our actions so thank you Thank you, Lucia, for a very elegant set of studies. Uh, you can you choose the yeah. question, but I ask that you speak into a microphone because this is also broadcasted. So. Thank you for the beautiful talk. Uh, the last part of the talk, uh, for instance, the uh, subjective uh, distortion of, of uh, sizes, so on. What do you think it's related to conscious processing? Uh, maybe you can test it with unconscious uh, paradigms. So you're, I think you're right. What we, what we were trying to make a case for there is that we have a sense of our body, you know, and that that will will affect even the things that you know like we are seeing, right? So then that yes, that was this it, it's would be to also a prior which yeah. is affecting yeah. unconscious uh, uh, processing. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. It it's more to close the loop that you know what we see is not only like it it has to interact with you know like how am I gonna or it has to relate to how I'm going to interact with that object, and that is something that we don't, that we don't usually take into account. That's it. But you're, you're totally right that it can be absolutely unconscious. Yes. Hey, thank you. I couldn't agree more with the overall message. I wanted to ask specifically about the mechanism of stabilizing of perception. Mm -hmm. So why you, you could call it stabilization of perception. You could also call it uh, some form of interpretation or top-down perception. What constitutes the stabilization thing? So it's true that once you saw the dog, you always see the dog. But is this the essence of what this process is doing? Or maybe the essence is just labeling or categorizing and so on. It's not related to s stabilization over time. That's, yeah. that's the question. So, so I, I, there is, well, I didn't actually have the, the, I didn't have time to show the data, but it's not just labeling because it, it, it interfaces with the amount of information that you give, right? So you're not hallucinating, right? And how do we know that is because you, you know, for instance, if you're seeing disorientation and I show and I shift things, there's only up to a point that you apply these priors, right? So in that case, you could say, well, you're applying a label of, you know, a, a category boundary. Could be, but, you know, like, and then it becomes like semantics, that, you know, what do you really mean by that? Um, the, we know that is that when you think of, you know, like, uh, um, how, how do these priors actually, you know, relate to perception that, 
with the categories, it's actually interesting because you can think of, you know, when we looked at the, at the letters, for instance, if you tell the subjects A, right, they will also see the letters earlier, right? And you can also think that it's not necessarily only, you know, like uh, categories, but that you also have a specific idea as to what it would be. And we tested that by, for instance, so if you say A, um, you know, A is an interesting case because you can have an A like this or an A like that, right? And what they will see depends on actually what, what they, uh, they actually had imagined specifically. So it's not category per se, yeah. right? Um, so, yeah. Sorry, you had that. Well, of course, I never thought that I would be in a, in a position to defend uh, predictive coding as a theory of consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, of course, the, the broad version of, of, of predictive coding is that predictive coding is also present in, say, uh, the interaction between feedforward and recurrent mm -hmm. connections as they are already established by means of learning and what have you, of course, and maybe also genetically. Uh, but, of course, the, the experiments that are mainly done about, uh, about predictive coding is how these connections change. And of course, that, that changing is not a theory of consciousness, but rather of, say, learning. Uh, yeah, I can agree to that. But the more general version of predictive coding, in the sense that it's it, the, the, uh, that the interactions between, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the feedforward activation and the and, and the already established recurrent activations um, might still be then a theory of consciousness. Or would you also say that this is even this is not a theory of consciousness? I, I would, you know, I would say both. No. You know, so A, you know, my understanding of predictive coding is that it's also a theory of learning, and that that's why you know, like Carl is really pushing for it, right? Because you know, like these priors are not just ones, and you know, you never change them, right? Um, now, and th that's what he called like inference, and and you know, like the, the moment by moment. But the even if you actually just take the snapshot view, you know, like then what begs the question is, okay, if I have this hierarchical predictive coding of everything, you know, like from the higher areas going down to the lower areas, if that principle will explain consciousness, it will have to then tap into why some of those priors will affect my perception, some of those won't, right? Because it's not the case that all of them, you know, like affect your perception the same way, right? So even in that case, you would, you, you would need another you know, like, cut to say, like, well, only when it's, you know, like, IT to be poor, but not when it is B2 to be 1, right? So then it, it won't just fall out of the theory that the feed forward and the feedback will do it, right? Unless, you know, like, I mean, you may have a, a, a different view there, right? But, um, you know, at least in my view, like, I don't understand, like, why, you know, some, some, some of them will actually impact and some others won't. Wait, so there we have her. And you can have different types of priors. So for example, you can have a very simple prior, which is uh, the effect of memory. Mm -hmm. A very simple synaptic memory without a, a kind of a hippocampus or anything like that. Correct. And this will affect the way that you will, uh, the, the, uh, that you will react to, uh, to, to a new stimulus and it will prime you. Correct. So this is also a kind of a, a, a priming effect, yes. which is very different from the... <coughs> require some kind of hierarchy. Nevertheless, you do have memory systems, mm -hmm. which uh, like, like the hippocampus and other systems in, in, other, uh, in other kind of uh, animals that are sort of uh, superimposed on the very, very simple memory system that you find between uh, locally. Mm -hmm. can, you can you explain in what way the priors that uh, you are describing are different from this kind of uh, memorizations. So this is the case I was trying to build for the hysteresis and the adaptation, right? Because you can think that adaptation is a local phenomenon. You know, so in this case, so, so that, that's exactly actually why we, we went into that. Because we were, we were thinking of, okay, memories are, they, they function in the brain in different ways, you know? Uh, and, you know, and they not necessarily all will have the same phenomenon, the, the same effect, right? So, what is even more interesting is that, for instance, if you think of the adaptation, what it, didn't, what it didn't show is that you can have adaptation to an orientation that you never saw. So I think it also has an interesting aspect because it tells you that this local phenomenon will have an impact on your perception, but it will have an impact even when it's unconscious, completely unconscious, right? Um, so the only thing we can say is that, you know, like they impact perception, they are mapping to different mechanisms, and they may 
they may exert the effects also in a different ways, right? And um, even more interesting as well is the fact that, you know, when I, when I was explaining to Liad the, um, the hysteresis, for instance, by how much you can shift the, the, or you can keep your perception the same, is also different from the adaptation, right? So in this case, just very little differences will not have the same effect, right? Um, whereas in the, in, in the case of the hysteresis, you would actually have a longer effect. So it could also be something that Stan has been mentioned, has been uh, hypothesizing before with these windows of integration and why also, you know, consciousness may integrate over longer time scales. And it also seems to also map onto higher order areas, right? So it could, you can think of these two as lower order, shorter windows of integration, it can impact unconsciously. You know, higher order, long, longer windows, it can impact consciously. But it's just speculation. I mean, it just seems to map. I Mike. Uh, thanks for the talk. It's uh, two two comments, if you don't mind. I mean, one is um, predictive coding. Um, I just think that um, we might, or let's t take the hysteresis phenomenon. <laughs> Instead of articulating in the language of priors, mm -hmm. I would just think of articulating in the language of um, interrogation. Mm -hmm. I mean, we see in accordance with the questions we ask of the environment around us. So I think th I think that might be. Uh, a, a more useful concept. And then the second point I want to make, maybe uh, um, touches on what Victor asked you, which is that, you know, the, the idea that there's fee that feedback between areas confers some kind of prediction, I think is m based on a mischaracterization of the neuroscience, which is that, th I would say the fundamental fact is that there's no example we can come up with where a neuron that receives feedback shows any signs of the response properties of the neuron that's feeding back. So I don't think we can evoke feedback connections as, as, as um, support for predictive coding. I, you know, at first I don't, you know, I think you're going to have the chance to explain in your talk more like what you think of the affordances, but I, I, I don't understand, you know, like how to, you know, why you, why you cannot think of stress as a, as a memory. But for the, for the second aspect of your question, um, so I think there is new evidence um, so, for instance, Casper, you know, like has this, you know, they looked at um, in the hierarchy in, uh, in the, the uh, phase system, you know, so they took, they, they were recording an ML and they were looking at pairs of uh, phases, right? And what they observed is that the first part of the response in ML was like a feedforward one, but then the second one seemed to actually have responses that would only come from the area above. True, they didn't, you know, like record in the area above, so they cannot tell you, but at least what that seemed to do is that it seems to change the coding properties of the neurons in an area that was not coding for that particular property. So, you know, whether that is sufficient evidence, I'm not sure, you know, but I think that there is more that says that these feedback properties can actually be there, right? Uh, and they can change the coding mechanism of a, of a given area, right? Um, that's one thing. The second is, does that then mean that, you know, like, because you can also think of priors, as she was hinting to that, it doesn't necessarily have to come from an area above, right? It can just be lateral connections. That can also be, you know, like, so I, you know, in that sense, I think that these are two orthogonals. Like, how those priors take effect, it could be because in the predictive coding, it comes from above, but also in the predictive coding, you also have a, a mechanism to do it just within an area, right? So it doesn't have to be. Yeah. Okay, we should move on. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>